I guess this would be the first meeting for uh, the reading group session. And or rather the reading group, this is the first session of the reading group. And we shall move with, uh, discuss this, or rather start off this reading group with a pretty, uh, let's say, weird paper. And why I'd say this is because uh, this is actually a computer vision paper. But the way they approach the problem is similar to how, uh, you know, natural language processing researchers would approach a problem. So they're treating object detection as a language modeling task. And that would be pretty interesting. And they even give a very strong claim as to why it has to be done this way and how it can generalize to, let's say, you know, several other tasks such as image classification and even uh, image description, image captioning and so on. So uh, let me move on to the rest of the presentation. Uh, before I actually describe how they achieve the problem, of uh, treating this as a language modeling task, I want to I want to discuss a little bit on why they want to do this. Um, I mean, firstly, the intuition is that you know you're describing an object, and when you describe an object, I mean, in real life, you would you know you tell the person that you're that's the object and it's here, it's around here, look to your left and so on. And the second motivation would be that for uh, current object detection algorithms, there is a lot of you know, complex architectures. Firstly, you have a backbone, uh, you know, similar to how you have a pre-trained model in NLP, you have a backbone in CV, like ResNet 50 and so on. And on top of that, you have so many other, you know, different models. And then your loss function is also very specific. For example, you might have loss functions for regions of interest. One for, if you consider YOLO, I think it's intersection over union and uh, so many other things which play in, uh, into, you know, getting, uh, the object detection algorithm working. Uh, third one is not exactly a motivation, but then uh, they also have a discussion on, you know, what are the algorithms uh, which CV has borrowed from NLP and the algorithms NLP has borrowed from CV. Uh, it's in the paper. I'm not really listed it out here because that's not the objective of this talk, but I will show it to you later. Uh, moving on from here, I shall describe the way they've implemented the problem. So, uh, again, you know, you have to describe an object and the way you describe an object in object detection is by drawing a bounding box around it. So now the problem is how do you describe a bounding box and in object detection, another problem is you don't just detect that there is an object, you tell what the object is as well. So not only do you have to, you know, detect the bounding box, you'll also have to perform a classification task. Now. The way these people achieve it is that, you know, your bounding box is ultimately a bunch of coordinates. So as long as you describe what those coordinates are, you're effectively describing what the object is. So uh, your object is described by a phi tuple and, uh, you know, you have X min, Y min, X max, Y max in class. And what these X min, Y min and X max, Y max stand for at the top left and bottom right pixel locations of your bounding box. So if you have a rectangle, let's say, if, can you see my cursor? Yeah. Hello, is yeah, my cursor yeah. visible? Yeah. yeah. So if you have a rectangle, your left top and then your right bottom are described by those coordinates. And the last one is class. And class is, you know, uh, if you consider, let's say, a data set uh, like object 365 or so on, then uh, your class is going to be what is the object, right? And now, ultimately, once it's described as a phi tuple, your model should output the phi tuple. So now, how will I, how will it output a phi tuple, right? So now I'm going to tell you uh, what exactly is the architecture. So you take your image and then you pass it through an encoder, any image encoder, and uh, you get some embeddings of those images, right? Now you pass those embeddings to a transformer decoder and or rather an auto regressive decoder and this decoder will give you you know five tuples for every object present inside the image so if there are let's say 10 objects it'll give you 10 five tuples and then of course pad tokens and so on uh, or the end of sentence token in this case so ultimately we are treating this as a natural language generation problem right your vocabulary is now going to be the number of coordinates right from zero to uh, image length or image height and image width plus the number of class tokens. 
do you see why this makes sense because if you have you know your every pixel of your image or rather every segment of your image has to be you know one of the outputs of your language model and along with the class token so <clears throat> so far so good is everything clear or do you have some questions as to what exactly is happening here or are you completely lost so basically you are replacing the the image regression kind of thing with a transformer decoder that's right yes that's it okay. so ultimately instead of getting the bounding box as some kind of regression or you get multiple bounding boxes and take io u or something you just generate mm -hmm. the bounding box as though it's a language so okay uh, for those who are not aware you... oh yeah go on yeah so for those who are not aware uh, an encoder decoder model is like you know similar to how you would have an encoder decoder in any other case so you pass your input to an encoder you get some sort of representation maybe compressed maybe not compressed maybe it's actually larger and then you take that representation and pass it to something called a decoder and what decoders do is uh, you have let's say the input to the decoder you get an output from the decoder and but then you want let's say multiple outputs from the decoder so whatever output you get from the decoder at let's say the very first output you get that will become your input and uh, to the decoder again and then you get output at let's say you get a second output and then you keep repeating the same thing you get a third output fourth output nth output and the way you know the formal term for this is you'd get a bunch of time steps so the very first output would be your first time step and then you pass that as an input and get your second time step output and keep going on and on and on so ultimately you'll have let's say a sequence given a single input and our sequence in this case would be our bounding boxes for the objects uh, jay had another question before i interrupted him uh, yeah yeah so uh, basically uh, for the transformer decoder um, uh, how are you kind of enforcing the constraint that it's only uh, five tokens so this is they have not enforced that constraint so the paper does not actually enforce the constraint that the first four are coordinates and the fifth one is a class right uh, but then they have enough training samples for the transformer to actually inherently figure that out okay so and, it just kind of learns it okay yeah it just learns it and for pat for rudimentary patterns like this it's actually pretty easy for it to learn so uh, that's how it works and let's move on from here uh, i have a question uh, basically i have a question so basically the bounding boxes are derived from the phi tuple yes the bounding boxes are derived from what is coming out of the phi tuple okay. if there is an error yeah you can't derive the bounding boxes but then uh, and this is not this is what is not very clear in the paper uh, but they have assumed that you know your output is obviously going to be a phi tuple actually it's not supposed to be like that right it's a uh, in, in case the model decides to put the class in the middle you are basically screwed you can't create a bounding box but uh, yeah. they have not they have not described this problem but what my intuition is is that you know when you're dealing with natural language generation the model learns very rudimentary patterns such as the uh, end of the sentence is going to be a period or a question mark or something like that so it can follow a similar pattern this way just by giving enough training samples um okay. by the way your encoder and decoder none of them are pre trained uh you're using a completely empty encoder and decoder and you're hoping that it learns these representations um and another thing over here is that you know your bounding box is actually not discrete right your bounding box is continuous and the way they do this is one very lazy approach would be to consider every pixel of your image to be you know a discretization for your bounding box that is giving the coordinates of every pixel to be you know one of x min one of your pixels would be x min one of your pixels would be y min one of your pixels would be x max or y max but you don't have to go so far if you have an image let's say 1024 cross 768 you don't need to have you know 1024 uh what's it called coordinates or other numbers and then your class numbers you can discretize it and say you know i want only 512 numbers so it's like saying two pixels is now one coordinate and you can go even further you can make three pixels as one coordinate and so on and the paper shows the paper has a study 
that you don't actually have to go all the way down to you know one pixel uh, they quantize a 640 by 480 image into let's say 500 bins or rather you know 500 coordinates and they show that you can get uh, just the same amount of uh, object uh, you know bounding box errors or it's very minimal it rather plateaus at that point of time um, so moving on from here there's a simple visualization as to how it works so you can see that it predicts these bounding boxes and then it gives these five tuples for every object and once everything is detected it gives an end of sentence token saying you stop generating so so far so good the task is described, the model architecture is described, your inputs and outputs are described, but then there are some problems. It doesn't just stop here. So one of the problems they've faced is that, uh, I'll just move to the problems actually, is that you know your output terminates before detecting all objects. And let's say there are 10 objects. The model decides, you know, I'm going to detect five objects. And then my error is small enough for me to just send the end of sentence token. I'm not going to detect the sixth object or seventh object. And this is pretty bad, right? Um, you want all of your objects to be detected and your loss function over here is, you know, since you're generating everything, right? Your loss function is just going to be cross entropy, your uh, truth predictions versus whatever is uh, being generated by, you know, your model just regular cross entropy can actually enforce this uh, model prediction and and you know when you have let's say just a few more tokens to predict and your model decides to end uh, much before that your loss may not be too high uh, so this is a problem you'll have to fix separately and you know i have the answer here but let's just pretend you know what uh, the answer isn't there and let's just brainstorm for a moment what would you do in order to kind of uh, fix this problem, right? I'll just move to another slide. Do you have any other ideas before I actually discuss what exactly this paper is doing to fix such a problem? You're not getting enough outputs. What do you do for that? Anything basic could be there. Uh, for instance, I'll just start with whatever they have discussed. They're saying, you know, before it uh, outputs the end of sentence token, I'm just going to say, you know, the probability, I'm going to enforce some in some way that the probability of end of sentence token is going to be low. I'm not just, I'm just not going to generate the end of sentence token. That would be one out that that would be one way to, you know, kind of force the model to say, I'm going to spurt out some more nonsense before I throw an end of sentence and hopefully make it learn that, you know, those nonsense should be more objects. Uh, do you have any other way to do this? Any NLP guys? Uh, Sanitya, is he here? Uh, yeah, I'm thinking about it. Um... I could uh, I could push you towards something like Blue Score. You know, you've heard of the brevity penalty, right? Oh, uh, no. You've not heard of it. Okay. But yeah, essentially, there are some metrics where uh, uh, you are, you know, you have a lesser scoring if your model gives out very small output. Of course, it's not a loss function, but then you can enforce a brevity penalty on here, saying that if your model does not give out enough outputs, you penalize the model by increasing the loss function. But in both cases, uh, what they've noticed is your predictions are noisy. Uh, they can make the model spurt out more bounding boxes, but they cannot enforce that these bounding boxes have to be objects. It'll just throw it somewhere. So what these people have done is actually very surprising. Uh, instead of augmenting or rather forcing the model to generate more outputs, they say if we have 10 objects and the model is generating 6 or 7, I'm going to give 15 objects instead. And where am I going to get those 5 other objects? I'm not going to get them. I'm actually going to draw some random bounding boxes and I'm going to say that, you know, the class of these bounding boxes is noise. And it's up to the model to, you know, now that you've generated 15 bounding boxes, right, the model can you know, it'll be having a little stronger urge to generate more objects. And they're hoping that this surge at this point of time can can be used to, you know, kind of force that whatever bounding boxes are coming from object seven, eight, nine, and ten uh, can can be learned by the model. Because right now you're not you're not forcing the model to generate by decreasing, you know, likelihood or probabilities, but just by increasing the objects of your input. And there are some pitfalls here, right? 
how will the model know that you know the inputs you're giving is noise versus uh, actually giving uh, real inputs and so on uh, <clears throat> the way they have done this is by uh, set doing doing the following right you have your noise tokens or your noise bounding boxes to also be phi tuples so x min x max y min y x min y min x max y max and c so you they set the loss weights or rather whenever they cal calculate cross entropy they set the losses of your noise coordinates to be zero but not of the noise class so if the no model actually decides to start predicting you know noise bounding boxes it can throw in whatever tokens it wants for the coordinates but it should predict that whatever i'm predicting whatever four tuple i'm generating right now is noise so that should be the prediction of the model so whatever output it gives uh, it has an idea that you know after this what i'm predicting is noise and it, you can't claim that you know the model inherently understands its noise it just understands that you know after a point the classes which i'm going to be predicting is going to be the noise class so the way that would happen is uh, through this let's say uh, visualization over here so you can see these y1 y2 y3 y4 y5 right i borrowed it from the paper let's say your y5 over here is some kind of class token and similarly y10 and n so uh, normally what the model would do is it will start predicting y1 y2 y3 y4 y5 it will predict a class and then it'll give end of sentence and all of this is not going to be predicted so the way they fix that is by adding you know bunch of coordinates over here they've set it to na as a way of saying that you know we are setting the loss to be zero and then they have a noise class and similarly over here another noise class so it will start predicting y4 then it will predict y5 and then you know it sees that the input of my training sequence is actually much longer and as a result uh, it will start predicting more tokens and then you know it will hit y10 and if it stops at y10 great i mean you've got your input but let's say it doesn't let's say i decide you know, there's too many noise tokens i'm going to predict a little more and so it'll start predicting you know y11 y12 y13 y14 and it, as soon as it reaches y15 it'll predict that it's a noise token so whatever is over here firstly the loss is not even implemented for these tokens and secondly if you have the output with you and you have a noise class over here you can post process the output to just remove these tokens off right and ultimately get whatever is blue over here that is the 10 objects so does this make sense to you or are you still lost I can draw something for you in that case so that it's a little easier to visualize. So essentially, we are skipping out the US token by adding noise tokens. Yeah, they're skipping out the ultimately the US token will come over here. They're just adding more objects, that's all. So is this a way to equate sequence lengths so that we have all images with equal amount of objects? Or is it just to delay the US? It is just to delay the US actually. Uh, even if let's say one image has 12 objects and another image has 20 objects, you won't equate the sequence length with all the images. Ultimately, it's a decoder. It doesn't necessarily have to have equal sequence length. So um, the objective is to actually delay the end of sentence token over here. Okay. I mean, there are so many other ways to do it, right? You can, you can force it to not generate the end of sentence token by saying, uh, you know, instead of equal probabilities of uh, it being generated, you can do something while your output is being fed in to sort of, you know, prevent the end of sentence token from coming out or something like that. And there are ways to do it. The paper hasn't gone into it. And I don't want to go into it either because it doesn't work. But yeah, it doesn't work. So for some reason, this works. They have not really been very conclusive as to why this works, but it works. And I would... Uh, and then I like a I like to use a term for uh, things like this, and I call it divine benevolence. I'm moving on from there. So I just, uh, I just the result, have one question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So like uh, when it's training the normal way, and let's say the Wi-Fi mm -hmm. it produces the EOS. Um, mm -hmm. So I get the point. This is very clever. But like uh, let's say Wi-Fi was EOS. Uh, mm -hmm. Like you said, would the extra penalization be like it predicted uh, E of S early, but the target sequence length is actually much more, so you penalize it more. Something like that would it be? Yes, because in this case, your penalization is going to happen in like, let's say, five tokens, right? Mm -hmm. 
but then over here it's going to be 15 tokens correct correct so instead of creating some kind of hard penalization, they're creating something soft by increasing the loss value. So, yeah. Also, I can show some visualization. Hmm? Go ahead, go ahead. Once we reach the noise class token, what is it replaced with? The noise class token also needs to be replaced to some other class, right? That is probably there in the image. What object class does it get? No, they augment the vocabulary to have another class called noise class. Okay, so it does not uh, give us back cert, like some class that's already there in the image, some actual object. Yeah, uh, for, for these tokens, it will give you the class that's already there. These are noise, right? The bounding boxes is in random locations, so it doesn't actually have to do it. I can show you a visualization of that. Uh, let me see if it is downloaded. Yeah, it has. Oh, God. Good God. Froze. Let me share my whole screen. Yeah, is the whole screen visible? Yeah, it's visible. Hello? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah it's right. Okay. So you can see here, right? You have a bunch of ground truth objects and they augment it by just putting random bounding boxes over here. And ultimately it's on the model to predict these. And similar to this image, there, the model needn't predict whatever is over here, just needs to predict whatever is red. And the model has to predict that whatever white is there, that is noise. So once whatever output you get is noise, I can just throw these bounding boxes away because I know it is noise. Right? Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah. So let us assume that, you know, the model predicts these four and uh, they have not actually, you know, shown, they've not described this very well, but what exactly I would say these two images are is your, uh, you know, your ground truth Y and then your prediction Y hat. So your model is predicting these four bounding boxes. And, you know, there are some bunch of noises over here. And this, uh, this will be, you know, your Y. This is the bunch of, uh, this is your input and the noise. And this is the prediction of your model. It predicts the output. It also predicts the noise. But the thing is, you know, your noise is not weighted. So your, out your model has no incentive to actually predict these positions over here. But since these boxes are white and they're noise, you can throw them away after a point. And one interesting thing to note is that your model is actually just repeating these objects again. Right? So whatever is noise is just predicting this a little more. And that's probably the reason the model is able to capture these objects more. It just, there is some kind of enforcement that, you know, has to predict these objects and just throw these object coordinates again and again and again, because it has no incentive to actually predict these. And but then again, this is not actually described in the paper. This is just my uh, understanding of what's going on. So I'll move back to the paper. Uh, I'll move it into full screen so that it's a little easier. So I'll move, I'll talk about the results. And this is what is very, very surprising. Uh, lesser parameters, you get better average precision. And they have a few other, uh, you know, baselines they're comparing with. Unfortunately, they're not actually using, you know, uh, YOLO or, you know, the more uh, efficient, I'd say the more standard uh, practices for object detection. I'm not sure why. I hope it's not cherry picking, but they have uh, considered a faster RCNN and, you know, they have a backbone model and what, I don't know, Jay can correct me at this point, but what I think is that, you know, you get a backbone model, you feed the input uh, or rather your image to the backbone model, you get a bunch of features and then you use those features into your faster RCNN. Is that what a backbone model is all about? Yeah, that's uh, basically it. faster. Like the modules inside that are pre-trained. Yeah. So your, your R50 or your ResNet 50 at this point, uh, firstly, before I actually move on, does anybody, is anybody unfamiliar with what a ResNet 50 is? They can tell it out, it's okay. 
okay good everybody seems to be familiar with this pretty impressive but all right so your resnet 50 is a backbone and you know there's something called fvn i won't really go into that but uh, they use that for a faster rcnn they calculate average precision they also have this model called detr and that's kind of similar to what pix to seek is doing except pix to seek has a five tuple and detr has a four tuple they don't predict the class the way the class is predicted is by using a different transformer head in your decoder and for those who are not familiar with it it is okay we are not having a discussion about transformers but actually uh, uh, you know transformers can be parallelized by training you know multiple different outputs at the same time and they are called as you know transformer heads so <clears throat> this is in very layman terms and they use two different kind of outputs for prediction and pix to seek decides to overrule the whole thing and say i'm going to just throw in the vocabulary along with the coordinates and i'm hoping i'm going to pray that the model actually learns to distinguish the between them and apparently that works uh, there are you know lesser parameters not by a long shot but by a decent shot and you have better performance over here and what is even more surprising is that if i have uh, parameters using you know much larger models as well even then it's able to beat it so this is i don't know around four times lesser parameters it's still able to go ahead with it get a better uh, performance sure there is a point one uh, performance drop but i won't consider that so that is what is the most surprising aspect of this paper and there are some selling points with this paper right so this uh, it's that you know you're using a simple encoder decoder loss you're using encoder decoder architecture and this is there for a host of other things and secondly you're using just cross entropy no specialized loss that uh, no pooling no kind of sub sampling and so on you just need to use in uh, cross entropy and then say you know this is what is going on and it can generalize to other tasks right now what i have told is i've just changed the way the output works right but if i want to do image captioning i can use the same architecture just change the output and then i can use the same model it will still work and that is their main selling point they say that you can proceed with whatever you want with this you're just saying that we're going to use this for this task and it works so uh that's about it i guess from my side this is my first presentation in a while and as a result i may not be doing a very good job so please give me feedback on this uh here are some sources which you can look at and you know the source code for this you can play around they have a jupyter notebook also <clears throat> and uh, you know the paper itself is over here i can give you know a little larger study as to what exactly is happening before i truly conclude what's going on so they have a bunch of ablations right they they have this thing called quantization bins versus performance and what i mean by that is you know you remember the time where i was saying two pixels for one coordinate one pixel for one coordinate that's uh, what it's about they call that as quantization bins and they have you know outputs for those as well so you can see that you know for a 640 pixel you know i think it's height 640 or width 640 i'm not particularly sure but yeah 480 by 640 so 640 is height <coughs> when they have 500 bins they are achieving you know very reasonable performance for object detection in fact even if you consider n bins to be 100 right there are some errors but they're not too high so you don't have to you can do with lesser vocabulary and because of which you can do with lesser you know you don't have to increase your embedding size you don't have to go with a lot of positional encoding and so on because you're dealing with transformers over here and you know lesser time for inference so yeah and they also have you know a graph that shows that it plateaus as we keep going on so they say you know after quantization to be 500 there's not much of a performance improvement how exactly they go with 5000 for an image which is a 640 by 480 is beyond me i have no idea but then they say that you know you can just cut it short over here and they also have another one with sequence augmentation and without sequence augmentation the graph is pretty skewed because you have average precision starting from 34 to 40 but then there is an improvement so with you know sequence augmentation you have a uh, higher average precision they also have average recall uh, although they have not really reported it but then they say as soon as you know they notice a trend in the recall increasing they have a drop in precision but it's not over here 
they also have another ablation saying that you know they are doing a few other studies where uh, aside from using a pre-trained backbone model they consider you know two data sets one is coco and one is objects 365 and they say we're going to pre-train on one and fine-tune on the other so uh, and this doesn't really make sense because your task is the same but let's just assume for the sake of argument it does and they are doing you know ablations where they are doing sequence augmenting and pre-training and sequence augmenting and fine-tuning and uh, so on but uh, personally i think this is just a way to increase the size of the paper but i i'll take it right they also have you know visualizations for cross attention and so on but i'll continue Can you share that. that visualization yeah sure so decoder has two kinds of attention they have a self attention layer they also have a cross attention layer so they are giving cross attention visualization I think I'll move down and there might be some more. I don't think so. Yeah. Sir, uh, let's join the other link. I think it's about to expire. Or below. Yeah, in five the... minutes. Oh. Mm. Okay, so I'll stop the recording for this session and then we'll move to the next session. Oh, go ahead.